Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I have the charge of introducing our speaker this evening, but before I do that, I want to introduce to our speaker some of my favorite people here in the state of Indiana. Uh, lots of good friends. I consider these all my friends, and I'm sure they'll be your friends as well. Our speaker this evening is, as you know, Mr. Robert Enlow. Uh, Robert is the president and CEO of the Friedman Foundation, one of the leading advocacy groups for school choice here across the country. Uh, the Friedman Foundation has been involved in advancing school choice in many states, uh, not only here in Indiana. Robert's been with the Friedman Foundation since 1996, when it began, uh, and has moved up the ranks and now is the president and CEO uh, of the foundation. And I know Robert well, and his personal mission is to ensure that every child across this country has the ability to choose a quality school. Uh, Robert, being the president and CEO, we've been very blessed with his very hands-on approach here in the state of Indiana in helping to ensure that our school choice programs were not only uh, passed legislatively, but have been implemented successfully. And you'll hear more about all those numbers uh, and how successful we've been in the state of Indiana. Um, Robert's here not only to educate us this evening about school choice, but he's here to challenge us. He's here to challenge each and every one of us here in the room uh, to not only engage in this school choice initiative here in the state of Indiana, but to embrace this new educational culture which we find ourselves in. And even to go beyond embracing it, but to be leaders in that. And so without really further ado, my friend and colleague, Robert Enloe. Thank you, John. Appreciate it. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's, it's not hard to see why John loves you all. You're from Evansville, as I am. Evansville <laughs> folks are great, and, and the Evansville area and surrounding area. So this is our, my hometown, so it's great to see you. Uh, I have to apologize for a couple things up front. One, if I uh, challenge and I offend, I apologize. Uh, but I hope this will be a dialogue at the end, particularly. And two, for those of you who've heard it already, I apologize uh, if you've heard it in other, uh, other arenas. And, and I think the third thing I, I want to make sure I apologize for is you guys have had a lot of food and I hope I don't bore you to death, right? But I hope that's not the case. Look, four things, five things I want to do tonight when we talk about school choice and the issue of school choice. By way of introduction, so the Friedman Foundation for Educational Choice was started by Milton Friedman and his wife Rose, the Nobel Laureate Economist in 1976. In 1955, as far way back then, he came up with a very simple idea. It is fairer, more equitable, and more efficient to separate the government funding of education from the government running of schools, right? We're the only Western democracy that has linked those two things in our school systems. And as a result, we've created a centralized monopolistic school system that has not worked for the vast majority of our children. A shining light against that has been our traditional non-public school sector. But that non-public school sector over time has, create, has been in a niche marketplace. This is, this is what's happened when you create a monopoly, right? The non-public school sector ends up in a, uh, a, a, monop a situation where they're either an elite school that charges high tuition or a mission-driven school. This is typically how the marketplace works. And so Milton Friedman th said it was much more effective and efficient to create a system where the money basically is strapped to the back of children and then go to any school regardless of type. So that's our mission. We work in 40 states every year at least. Uh, and uh, our, we do research, uh, advocacy, advertising campaigns, uh, anything we can to educate the public and get the mission done. Tonight, what I want to do is I want to have five quick points. I want to talk about the current marketplace in Indiana and in private schooling. I want to talk about what the public support is. So basically, what's your customers? What's your marketplace and what are your competitors doing? What are your customers saying about the idea of school choice and the idea of schooling? What has been the growth of school choice around the country? Uh, and where does Indiana fit in that? And then I hope the dialogue part of this is sort of, what has been that impact on non-public schools in Indiana? And what are some of the challenges that non-public schools, I think, will face as they go forward? Many of you, again, I apologize. You guys are uh, administrators and school leaders. And, and I've been on a school board, and I'm now on another school board. But you guys do this every day. So you have a level of expertise that I don't. So I apologize up front if I make broad sweeping comments about the challenges because you live them. But it is important to talk about some of these challenges as we go forward. So let's take a quick look at what the current marketplace says. What does the current marketplace for private schools look like 
around the country, and what are your competitors doing? So this is the current state of private school enrollment across America. Private schools grew from till 2002 in general, but they're down 10%. They're only 10% of children, they have gone down. Right, they're down from 12% in 1995 to 96. Overall enrollment is down by about 400,000 in private schools, and that lost is almost entirely in Catholic parish and conservative Christian schools. Now that's just what the data says for the Department of Edu Education. Let me tell you what a picture does. A picture's worth a thousand words. Just look at the trend lines. This has been the, light, the last since 1995. The Catholic total's gone down. The non-sectarian has seen a slight tick up, along with the unaffiliated, but then the Christian schools have also gone down. You've seen a decline in your marketplace, in your share of the marketplace. This is what's happened between 1995 and 2011. What are your competitors doing? Public schools are expected to increase by 3.4 million, million by 2020. Charter schools have seen dramatic growth, right? In 1990, there were zero charter schools. Now there are over 5,000 brand new schools in this country. They're 3% market share of the entire student population already. They're going to be, have a 300% increase since 1999. Charter schools are blowing up around the country. Homeschooling is up by 400,000 kids. I mean, it's gone from uh, about 1.5 million to 200, 2 million right now. It's tremendously growing. And virtuals have gone virtually amazing. I mean, who here has seen the Khan Academy? Has anyone seen the Khan Academy? Raise your hand. This open source technology is going to change education as we know it. Right? Blended learning. Who's here has heard of blended learning? So I just joined the board of Carpe Diem Charter School. Let me tell you what it looks like in Indiana. Seven teachers take care of 300 kids and they get more touches per child per hour than the traditional school sector does. It's an amazing model. Their, set, their numbers are great. And they do it by basically creating a circular school where the kids are online, but it the seven teachers are in the middle and they have computer screens. And when they can see seven or eight kids, not passing that part of the, say, the fractions, they go get them and stick them in a room and teach them. Bring them out, put them back on. Kids not doing well in history, they're not passing their, their Declaration of Independence stuff. Pull out the five kids, go take them in a room and educate them. The virtual schooling and blended school models is amazing, are amazing right now. The competitors that you face are tremendous in their, their aggressiveness to, to grow, particularly in the technological sector and the charter school sector. Public schooling is just going to grow by virtue of the fact that we keep consolidating districts in some ways, right? Uh, in 1950, there were 155,000 school districts in America. Who can tell me how many there are now? 14,753 for a population that's twice as large. We've created a massive consolidated sector, and, and most people think we have too many school districts. Of course, I think the opposite, we have too few. So that's what your, your marketplace is doing. Again, that's you guys. And that's your competitors. That's the, that is the market you face in the growing coming years. Now, what do your customers really want, right? So you now see a little bit about what your consumer, what your marketplace looks like. What do parents and what do consumers really want? So we know that they want school choice. We know that across the board. I'm sure you know that. We, we know that when, they, when they're asked, do you support the idea of school choice? You're looking at 67% of the total population and 66% of moms uh, who either strongly or somewhat support. And, and look at the differences between strongly and strongly opposed, strongly support and strongly opposed. Your customers want more school choice. They want and are demanding more options. But here's something also interesting, which I think should give you hope. This is a new finding. They want government schools, but they don't want necessarily government-run schools. They want government funding, but they don't want necessarily government-run schools. We ask a question, should the public government be, should the government be responsible for funding education? And of course, 82% say absolutely they should be. But then we ask a follow-up question, should the government be solely responsible for running and operating schools? And as you can see, not nearly the kind of support. You have a lot of parents who want a lot more options, and they're happy to have that funding go anywhere. Now across the country we do polling, and I'm sorry I don't have the Indiana poll here, but we ask a question, if money were no object, basically if money were no object and you could choose, what school type would you choose? This is an unaided question, which means we don't tell them, you could, we give them the options. We just say, 
here are your, here's, what, here's the criteria. Money's not an object, you can go anywhere you want. And here's what across the country and states around us say. The red is regular public schools, the yellow is private schools, the green is charter schools, the purple is vir virtual schools, and the blue is homeschooling. You have across, all, all around us, people want a diverse marketplace of options. Your customers want a diverse marketplace of options. Here's what's really interesting. Indiana's numbers are roughly the same as I think Illinois, uh, between Illinois and Tennessee. 39% in Illinois want to choose private school. How many percent in Indiana choose private school? Total? Anyone know? 9%. 9 to 10% of kids in Indiana are in a private school setting. That's a 19, that's a, so 9%, that's a 30% potential increase in market share that's waiting for you, right? So you have a tremendous amount of customers who want the ability to uh, change uh, their settings if they're educated and informed. So again, let's quickly go over that. People are wanting more school choice. They don't care where the money's coming from, and they want a diverse opportunity. The hope of the, 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 the upside of the marketplace is you have a consumer who's willing to choose and who wants more options. The downside is you guys have been on a downward trend in the private school, non-public sector for a while, and you're gonna have a challenge to meet that demand. So that's, that's what your marketplace is doing. What's, what's happening with school choice around the country? When, the Freeman Foundation started in 1996. There were six school choice programs operating in six states. A couple small tax credit programs, one in Iowa uh, and one in uh, Illinois, I think. And one, two voucher programs, one in Vermont and one in Maine that have been there since the 1880s. And this new, two new programs, one was the Milwaukee voucher program for low-income kids and the other one was the Cleveland voucher program for low-income kids. That was all that existed in terms of school choice unless you were going to pay for non-public schools or move out of the district to a place where you got chose a different public school setting. What has been the growth? 2011 and 12, without a doubt, have been the two greatest years for school choice growth around the country. And by school choice, I mean the following. I don't mean charter schools, that's been growing. I mean the use of government dollars, government taxpayer dollars, to allow parents to choose any non-public setting. That's what I mean. In those two years, 42 states have introduced school choice. 112 bills have been, in, have been introduced, of which 14 states have enacted choice programs. Uh, 26 states were actually, 26 bills were actually passed. 12 new programs created and 14 programs expanded. This is dramatic growth in the issue of school choice. Well, way bigger than anything else that's happened in the last uh, decade beforehand. So you're talking about a situation where, let's go back here. Parents want a diverse marketplace. Look at the growth of school choice. You're beginning to see parents getting what they want. They're getting more access to more options. We had some huge wins in 2010, 11, and 12. North Carolina. State of North Carolina now allows any parent with a special needs child to claim a $6,000 personal tax credit to send their kid to a private school. Direct personal tax credit. It's huge, right? That marketplace is a marketplace there for special needs kids, I think in a range of, of 60 to 70,000 children that non-public schools will be able to take. Florida has expanded its tax credit program. They have a scholarship tax credit program in Florida which allows companies to contribute to nonprofit organizations which give out vouchers. I call them vouchers with the middleman. This is what they are, right? And that program has gone from 50 million when it started to this last year 180 million. And they're meeting the cap. That program is specifically for low income children and it gets $4,000 per child. It has 37,000 kids in it already. Um, Colorado, Douglas County School Board, Colorado. It's an amazing story. This is a suburban school district, right? Very wealthy. Think Zionsville. Think McCutcheonville, right? Think that, right? And this school board said, well, hey, man, hold on. We're the actual school board of all the kids in our district. We're not just a school board for the kids who go to traditional public schools.